Um, we're moving to our next speaker, Gary Stocks. Um, born in the United Kingdom, Gary was raised in the uh, Mediterranean where his love affair with the ocean first formed. He has been living in Asia for the past 31 years and previously held the position of Asia Director for the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society for five years. Gary has spent the last 20 years investigating and exposing the shark fin industry, gaining international media coverage for the cause, as well as working with airlines and shipping lines to investigate and shut down shark fin shipping routes. When not exposing the shark fin industry, he's investigating shipping routes for possible transnational wildlife crimes or on a beach analyzing trash to better understand the plastic pollution crisis. Besides heading up Oceans Asia, Gary also owns a successful plant-based restaurant and bar in Hong Kong, which he uses to help people experience everyday plant-based dishes. Also, if you haven't done it yet, please check out the recent documentary, Suspiracy, about the environmental impact of fishing, featuring Gary Stocks. Um, Gary's topic for today's webinar is veganism and the fate of our oceans. Um, we are excited to learn from you. Hi there. Well, thanks for having me. Um, can you hear me clear enough? Because yeah. uh, we're just on the outside bit here. Let me just uh, switch over the screen and just uh, make sure it all works. So, how are we going there? Can you see that? Is that yep. clear enough? Your... Okay. All right. <laughs> so yes, um, a, a very hot topic at the moment, especially with the release on uh, Netflix of uh, the new movie, Sea Spiracy, which is causing a lot of controversy around the world uh, in all forms, um, from expected sources and, and not so. Um, but yeah, let's just uh, crack into this and um, I, try to explain where I see and, and where you know, I, I'm hoping we're going to see the, uh, the future of mankind heading. Um, but first of all, I just want to say I'm not a preachy vegan. Um, it's more a question of when I get asked about it, I uh, like to share my knowledge. So obviously my background is with the oceans. So uh, let's focus on those. So at the moment, and as Till has already spoken before me and, and already given a highlight on a lot of this, I'll just whisk through these slides. But uh, yeah, so currently 90% of the world's global fisheries are fully exploited or overexploited, depleted, or in a state of collapse. Now, you know, this is from the FAO, um, and you know, this is indisputable. I've been out on the high sea, I have seen a lot of this. A lot of it does actually go on out of sight of land. So obviously, you know, people just don't really see it. They don't get it. Um, and as Till quite rightfully pointed out, illegal fishing or IUU fishing is one of the biggest problems uh, with one in five fish that ends up in the supermarkets or, uh, you know, in the marketplace being illegally caught. And um, as he sort of went over, but this is where we're looking at illegal fishing, we're not looking at these sort of, it's not just pirate vessels. Um, this is just anybody who could be fishing without a license, exceeding quotas, targeting undersized fish, targeting endangered species, using banned gear, I and mean, all these things, repacking it, using it as mislabeling, and transshipping at sea. And that's one of the focuses that I spend a lot of time on. Um, a piece of software called uh, a website called Marine Traffic. And what we do is we actually track uh, fishing fleets and also more importantly, the reefers. Now a reefer is, I will show you what a reefer looks like. This is a reefer, this is a refrigerated cargo ship. And this is actually how most of these fishing fleets operate. They operate out of sight of land. They're away from home for four, five, six months at a time, maybe even longer. Some vessels have been known to stay at sea for five to six years. And these reefer vessels basically go out, they rendezvous with the fleet on the high seas, they offload the catch onto the ship, and the ship replenishes these uh, 
these industrial fishing vessels with fuel, with food, uh, with change of crew, uh, for those that are not, uh, unfortunately, they're under slavery conditions. Um, but because of these reefers, they also do promote the whole slavery at sea, where people are actually held hostage and they cannot escape because the ships never come home. They never come to a port or close to land. So transshipment is, is a way of uh, getting your illegal catch back to a port, back to land. I mean, this one here uh, we documented was uh, the Fuyan Yuleng 999, and that was predominantly catching sharks. So all these little black boats here, there was 15 of these operating in East Timor and they were catching sharks, even though they were only licensed to catch fish and a, a, a mandate was put on them, do not catch sharks, but all they did was catch sharks. And there was 15 of these vessels offloading onto this big reefer. This reefer is quite famous now. It's called the Fuyan Yuleng 999. And shortly after this photo was taken from a drone in Timor, we tracked this vessel back to uh, its home port in uh, Fuzhou in China, where then after offloading it headed across the Pacific and rendezvous with a few other fishing boats uh, just northwest of the Galapagos before entering the Galapagos. And it was in the Galapagos that the national parks um, actually boarded and arrested and detained the ship. So this ship is actually still in custody. The crew went to prison. Um, or the officers went to prison anyway, the crew were uh, sent home. Uh, but this is just one small example. And when Till mentioned earlier about how many fishing vessels there are out there, keeping a track of them is very hard. But if you just look at the reefers alone, we can really condense that down. And, and just watching where they're going and who they're rendezvousing with is, uh, is a key to what, what we do. So, Anybody who has seen the movie Sea Spiracy and those who haven't, I recommend having a look. Um, and one of the major problems, obviously, is about overfishing um, and the fact that, you know, the fish supply is running out. The oceans are becoming empty. So should we all stop fishing? Should everybody stop, stop fishing? Well, that is kind of the message that people, some people have taken from this. Um, but unfortunately, it's not the people on the left here uh, are artisanal fishermen, coastal communities. They've been fishing for centuries, if not longer. They are not the problem. They have been catching fish all their lives. They catch enough to eat, to survive and everything else. The problem is the industrialized fishing vessels and fleets, which are on the, on the right there. Uh, these vessels are from developed countries. They are subsidized heavily by taxpayers' dollars. They're coming largely from the EU. Uh, we're getting them from China, from Japan, Taiwan, um, and also the States and places like that. So we are getting these large industrial ships, and these are going into the waters of uh, these poorer nations and literally strip mining them of fish resources. And uh, that's, that's kind of where the issue is. So the issue is we need to stop industrial scale commercial fishing, not the coastal artisanal fishes. And that was kind of where the movie Seaspiracy was targeting at is the consumers of these industrial scale commercial fishes. Uh, the consumers being largely in the West, um, in Western society, obviously, we go to supermarkets and uh, they're just stocked to the brim with cheap fish. And those are coming from these large industrial scale commercial fishes. So, you know, where is all this fish going? Because, you know, they are catching, you know, millions and millions of tons. Well, of the annual catch, 34, or basically a third of the world's global catch of fish goes for animal feed. So that's 34.8 million tons was used, or 36% of all the fish caught was used for animal feed. Now that's feed to feed to another animal. Now these are fish that could have been 
eaten. Um, now, that animal feed is split up between 56% of it is being used for farmed fish, agriculture. Uh, we've got 20% going to pigs, poultry, and others. So we're looking at over 12 million, 12.7 million tons are being used annually just on this. In Peru, for example, which creates 50% of the world's fish meal, um, yet half of its population are living in a critical poverty position. Uh, you know, they are starving. And yet we're catching all these fish, all these anchovy, and making it into fish meal and selling it to these developing nations to feed salmon and uh, tuna and, and things like that, to fatten up higher quality, higher grade fish that fetch more money in the market. So rather than feed the world, fish are actually being taken and used to fatten up fish for the Western palate. I say the Western, but developed nations and that's where the, the whole imbalance is, is coming into play. It takes three to five pounds to produce one pound of farm fish um, and we're, we're looking at that. This photo I took in the Mediterranean in Malta. This was a tuna pen for bluefin tuna. Uh, Mediter Mediterranean Atlantic bluefin tuna which fetch anywhere over a hundred thousand US dollars some fish have gone for in Japan. So these are highly priced fish. They are huge, uh, you know, two, three, four hundred pound fish. And they, they are very, they have a very voracious appetite. So they have this net here and they, they basically put one ton of bait fish, which would be like anchovies, sardines, things in that, just to fatten up. And this is every day one ton of bait fish just to feed this one cage which has got about about a thousand bluefin tuna in this one cage so the the, the numbers are just astounding what's even more astounding is that we are feeding fish to pigs now have you ever seen a pig catch a fish um because i certainly haven't um these fish, uh, these pigs are photographed in Bimini and they actually live on a beach and they don't even catch fish. But we're feeding two and a half million tons uh, of fish to, to feed pigs. This is how bizarre and twisted we've now become, is that we're actually taking wild fish and feeding it to animal livestock. Another one, everybody loves kittens, so I had to put a kitten in the, in the picture, but cats, Domestic cats are, are, are basically using 2.4 million tons of fish for their domestic cat food. Now, I know we've grown up in a society where we, are, as a kid, I used to watch Tom and Jerry, and you always had Tom with a fish and everything else, but cats don't actually like water, so I don't know how they're going to catch the fish. Um, obviously, tigers and things, that might be slightly different, but your domestic household cat... Um, they would probably be likely eating, uh, you know, uh, rats or mice or sort of small vermin or small birds, not fish. But actually, we're now feeding them this much fish. Um, but to put it into comparison, the North Atlantic gray seal consumes 314,000 tons of fish. Now, they are meant to eat fish. Um, but this is how we are literally throwing ecosystems out of whack completely. Another one now, if for those who have seen the movie, there's a, a big thing on this sustainable labeling. And that's always been a bear bug with me as well. Um, a lot of talk, this, this buzzword of sustainable seafood. Uh, it's, a, it's a myth. Um, it, if it could become possible, then that might be an option. But at the moment, there is no such thing as sustainable seafood. That's one of the things I would like to say. Um, that's my opinion from my research and things that I've been looking into. Um, but for example, this tuna, this bluefin tuna I photographed in Hong Kong at a food expo. It was heavily being promoted as sustainable from Friends of the Sea. And it was from the Southern Oceans. It was from Australia. And you only have to look at the IUCN red list to see that it's actually critically endangered. So why or how are these organizations called 
Friends of the Sea or MSC or any of these other labels getting away with slapping this on, saying it's uh, sustainable, and yet it's still listed as critically endangered. Of all the bluefin tuna, the southern bluefin tuna is the most endangered. Um, so, you know, it, it really does throw the whole sustainable seafood um, into complete disarray. And um, yeah, where do we go? So obviously I live in Hong Kong and as from my intro, you were saying about sharks and shark fin. Um, this was a photo I took back in 2013. This was a rooftop in Hong Kong. It was just covered in shark fin. And we estimated about 40,000 shark fins. And shark fin is, has basically dominated my life for the last probably 15 years or trying to track down the shark fin industry, expose and exploit it and uh, try to hamper it and shut it down as best we can. However, this is not just a China problem. This is what I like to call a global shark crisis. It's not the Chinese that are killing all the sharks. It's everybody around the world killing sharks. They sell the fins to China. The meat goes to other countries like Australia, where they're buying, they're using meat in the fish and chips for flake and chips, or in Brazil, or in Latin America, where it's served raw as ceviche. Uh, the meat is being used, the liver oil is being used, the cartilage is being used in health products and supplements. So this is a global shark problem. And one of the things that I do see a lot of is this racism that comes up into, uh, into the whole environmental movement where people are, you know, they like to blame, you know, Asian nations or African nations or poorer nations. And, and it's just completely wrong. Um, and I get very defensive about China in a way when it comes to the shark fin issue. Yes, they are creating the demand for the shark fin soup. And that is bad, period, full stop. However, we are not just killing sharks for, for the fins. We're actually killing them for everything. So we need to look on a global scale and not be pointing the finger at one person. Let's look at it, shut it down across the board. And um, it's not just sharks. I mean, we just, just, just to go down to a market here um, in some of the seafood restaurants, you have these giant tanks with all these huge, big tropical wild fish. This is the live reef fish trade. And a lot of these, uh, these fish are actually protected. Some of them you need a CITES permit and some of the restaurants will proudly be displaying the CITES permit that allows them to have say Napoleon rafts to two animals a year. But nobody knows which those animals are because they don't have names and they don't have uh, barcodes written on them. Um, so these fish are just constantly bought in and sold and exchanged and another one comes in. So long as they don't have more than two in the tank, nobody really gets any, uh, any grief for it. But these fish are key to the uh, ecosystems uh, of the planet. And um, we're wiping those out with our luxury dishes and, and banquets. But it's not just the fish. We, we literally are eating the oceans alive. Um, this is, you know, this is everything from crustaceans to, um, you know, to the fish to you name it, everything. And also everything that goes on the bottom. I mean, Till loves that video with the sea cucumber. Well, these are your sea cucumbers that are dried, very key animals in the uh, marine ecosystem, but they are being sent into Hong Kong by the ton. Um, and nobody really seems to notice, care, or do anything. Um, most of the environmental groups are focused on the um, sexy sort of animals, the uh, sharks, the dolphins, the turtles. Nobody is really looking at uh, sea cucumbers or fish more or um, abalone or even seahorses. So, um, you know, the next thing is what can we do about it? And as individuals, um, you know, I had my own personal uh, battle inside. Uh, I, my background as well as being a photographer was actually in food and beverage. And I have shares in a small bar over here in Hong Kong, a bar and restaurant that was a famous barbecue bar. We were selling ribs and burgers and things like that. And over the years, it, it really started an internal battle in me. Here I was trying to fight and save the ocean, but I was being a hypocrite 
selling all these products. So I looked at, um, well, there we go. So this is my bar and restaurant. This is not just a plug for, for, for Hemingway's, but it's, uh, it's more important. It was this, the message. We were selling all this seafood and meat and everything else, and I couldn't carry on. So I tried to sell. My partner then said, I want to, you know, I want to sell as well. So I ended up buying it. And my wife thought I was crazy because now I was going to end up with a, a whole share of a restaurant that was selling meat. And I said, no, we're actually going to turn it completely plant-based to which she thought I was completely insane and we're going to lose all of our money. Um, but this was the bar and we've uh, transformed it into the menu is completely plant-based. And what I wanted to do was use this as an example of how you can live every day to day you know you, you can you, you don't have to go without um you know you can have pretty much most of your mainstream you know dishes that you'd be having you, you can have your curries you can have your your pizzas you can have your burgers even some of the uh some of the uh, plant-based alternatives now are so so good that they actually are better than the original in some some went in nutritional wise um and they're also obviously cruelty free so you know with our menus and things you know we can have everything i mean pretty much there is is a, a plant-based alternative for everything so why would you put the world at you know the oceans and the fisheries at such a pressure point where we really do need if we are in the position to make a choice and we're privileged enough that we have this choice, then surely the responsible thing to do is make the choice to go for something that is better for the planet, better for yourself, and also um, compassionate and pain-free. There's no suffering on anything on our menu. Um, I think there were some plants that may have been killed, but um, that's a whole new subject. Um, but when we look at the seafood alternatives, there are so many brands now that are coming up with these seafood alternatives. And that, that starts a whole other question of why do vegans want to have, you know, things that look like, um, you know, burgers and, and shrimps and things like that. It's, it's not necessarily the really extreme vegans that actually want that. They don't want it. But this is more for the people who aren't vegan and would just like to have something that is a bit more uh, ethical, a bit more responsible. And whether you go vegan once a week, twice a week, or completely seven days a week, every single bit helps. If the whole world went you know, plant-based for two days a week, that's a third of the problems over and done with. So these are some of the, the other alternatives. Um, and I think I'm pretty much uh, wrapped up here. Um, and put it back to Lou, I guess and answer any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Gary. That was um, an amazing presentation. And I think um, you were raising really important um, issue. I have a question to you from myself. Yep. Um, I, I'm personally uh, very interested in um, sharks protection. I wrote my... Um, animal law LLM thesis on in, on the failure of international law to protect sharks. And I, was, um, and I just wanted to ask you, um, what do you think is the most um, challenging part of um, exposing shark fin industry? Uh, I think probably the most challenging is um, in doing the supply chain, actually finding where it's coming and where it's coming in. And one of the reasons for that is um, the shipping they are mislabeling um shipments that are coming in so where we've been now uh, we've been very successful with airlines and shipping lines who have put embargoes in and saying we won't carry uh, any shark products or shark fin so they label it as dried fish or marine product um uh, or dried seafood is a classic so these shipping lines don't realize it but they're actually shipping them in now if they're shipping them in as dried seafood, then that means that the customs, when they're coming in, aren't checking to see if they are protected sharks. So the, I think that's the biggest challenge with, that we're facing, 
is is that area is is actually you know it's all very well putting all these laws in place and getting you know going to CITES and getting these sharks protected, but if we can't find them, then it's just going to carry on. Yeah, especially taking into account that um, they're inhabiting international waters and they're like freedom of navigation, and this is very um, challenging. Um, another question is, what would you recommend on promoting uh, veganism among the people who are not ready for such significant changes that also involve cultural, traditional, and religious sites? Um, well, I, I, as I said at the very beginning, I'm not a preachy vegan, so it's very much what would I recommend? Um, try to cut out as best you can even just one or, couple, one or two days a week. And then, you know, sort of look out to, there are more and more restaurants. It depends, I guess, geographically as well, where you are um, as to what's available. Because, you know, in some of the, some of the Western countries, uh, they have so many different brands like the ones I was just showing. Um, but actually, these, these are actually quite expensive some of the time. But you don't need to be buying expensive packaged branded goods to be vegan. I mean, uh, rice and rice and vegetables is vegan, uh, for example, and it's the cheapest meal you could probably get. So it, it's, it's, and when we look at uh, religions and things, some of the best uh, vegan food I've had has been in Buddhist restaurants. Um, you know, they have been some of the mind, most mind blowing meals I've had have been in vegan re uh, Buddhist restaurants both in China and also in Malaysia, so. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, as vegan, I don't think it's um, really expensive because like if you eat whole foods, it's uh, not expensive. I guess some, maybe some like treats or junk food might be kind of pricey, but yeah. Um, the next question is, I want to know the attitude of Hong Kong people towards uh, veganism. Is that popular or not widely accepted by the public? Uh, veganism, plant-based movement is growing here as much as it is elsewhere. Um, the amount of vegetarians, I think it was in the recent survey, has like you know quadrupled in the past couple of years. Um, it really is becoming mainstream now. Um, but saying that, we are also the second largest consumer of seafood per capita in in Asia after Japan. So. You know, we've got a long way to go, but it certainly is. Uh, the mood is changing and, you know, restaurants like my own and, and many others are now popping up all over the place and plant based options are becoming a lot easier to find. Mm -hmm. um, OK, next question from one of the attendees. Um, Hi, Gary. I watched this piracy. Great work, Gary and Ali. Uh, what was the most challenging thing to expose during filming? Um, well, I filmed with Ali and Lucy for a couple of weeks here in Hong Kong. Um, so I only did the Hong Kong segment. And um, as you can see, there was so much literally bundled into the movie that we could actually make a movie on each of the individual parts. But the key part to see Spiracy was to try and get a bit of everything in there to show how it's all linked. And the project will develop from here on with bits where we're going to be extrapolating and doing like a whole thing on slavery, a whole thing on this, you know, the overfishing, a whole thing on the labels. So we can actually pull out. And that's what I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what Ali and the team at Seaspiracy come up with. Um, but as for challenges, um, I mean, we filmed a lot of the shark fin stuff here. We got chased down the road. Um, we were actually, it was during filming where um, I went around the corner to a 7-Eleven just to get a, a, a drink while they were filming some B-roll and I saw a, a container truck just st pulling up and starting to offload and that was Mertzk, the biggest shipping line in the world. And I called Ali and, and said, uh, I think you might want to get around here. So they came around and we were filming as they were offloading all these uh, big white sacks full of shark fin. And that was when I told Ali, you know, this is Mertz, the biggest shipping line, and they were the first to put the ban in. Um, so we documented it all. And then we actually reached out to Mertz um, just before going public with anything. And they were shocked. They were devastated. 
um, that it was being smuggled on their containers, you know, on their container ships. So they actually worked with us to put loads of extra keywords in their key searches. So when people are now booking, if you book a container to go on a Mertzk ship, for example, if you put dried seafood, the person taking the booking can say, can you open up the container so we can have a look, please? So, mm. you know, Mertzk did a fantastic job. That was all while we were actually right in the middle of filming it. We also filmed all the plastic section. Uh, I do a lot of work with plastic. Um, and I took them over to some of the beaches here that were trashed completely. Um, and, you know, the, the whole plastic part of Sea Spiracy is where, you know, that's, I think, where I'm seeing the most controversy because, um, you know, fish, fishing gear is definitely a major, major part of the pollution. And, not many NGOs, if any, are actually talking about cleaning up the plastic from the fishing industry. Governments certainly don't want to challenge. I mean, I know in Hong Kong, we our beaches are covered in polystyrene uh, from the polystyrene boxes that they keep all the fish in. Fishing boats are going past with like, you know, 100 boxes on the top and they're light and they blow off with the wind. And, you know, we've raised this with the government, but the fishing uh community or industry here are so powerful in government that nobody really wants to tackle them so when we talk about trash coming from the you know, the fishing companies it's not just the nets it's everything that comes with the fishing industry um but we also need to make sure that we do keep the momentum going with all the single-use plastic that we use in our day-to-day -day lives you know, we don't get to go and handle and deal with fishing boats every single day, but we do decide what we do with our, you know, day-to-day -day purchases. So buying plastic bottles, using straws. I mean, I started the last straw movement. So, you know, when we say straws are such a small minuscule part, they are a small minuscule part, but they are a part that has a, a role to play in the big picture of the plastic trash. So, you know, with last straw I changed I, I made paper straws and was selling those around Hong Kong we ended up supplying uh, Starbucks and Disneyland and you know people like that and we did over 25 million straws in the two years that I did it as a campaign 25 million paper straws as opposed to 25 million plastic straws that haven't entered the landfill or the or the ocean so you know but even that is 0.03 percent of the global you know, plastic problem. So we, we all need to play a role. And, and I think, you know, I'm going on a bit, but that's, that's, that's where I think when we watch the movie, we've got to put everything into context. And that's what I think Ali and the team were trying to do with the fishing nets is put it into context. That is the big issue, but don't stop the small issues because um, they are all, it's huge. Yeah, I think, especially in the light of the pandemic, people just uh, um, like, fishing problem just uh, remained uh, unnoticed and because of all those masks and gloves that were um, dumped into the ocean. Yeah, um, don't, don't, don't get me started on masks. Um, <laughs> last February, when yeah. we took that picture of me holding up the masks, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I posted it out online and I just thought, you know, just to give people an idea and just say, look, be responsible. And we had over half a million views that, that first night. And we've had Tills keeping a track of it. We've had over 5,000 individual news articles. Um, we've re he wrote, him and his team wrote a really good in-depth report about you know, the masks entering the ocean. We estimated 1.56 billion just last year entered the ocean. I mean, single-use masks is another form of single-use plastic that we just need to get under control, so. Yeah, <laughs> this is really um, horrifying. Um, the last question is how to help people who are involved in slavery on the fishing boats. That is a really hard question to, uh, <laughs> to, to finish on. Um, well, trying to avoid seafood would be one way completely, because if we can reduce the demand, then there won't be as many boats going out. It would be one thing. I mean, that's a very small, naive, but off the cuff way of uh, looking at it. Um, better enforcement at ports, uh, better ways of uh, you know, legislation and things like um, getting rid of um, transshipments, for example. 
stopping transshipments at sea would mean the vessels would have to come to port. If they had to come to port, then maybe we could put, you know, regulations in place where they had to report to harbour masters and things like that, where you'd be able to see if there were slaves on board. Um, but at the moment, they're going out to sea and they're staying out to sea five to ten years. So, and and even then, they're they're meeting up with other boats and putting the slaves on another boat, and then that boat comes in to port with a fresh crew. So there's you know it's it's a really really complex um, topic, and I can't really answer it in this. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> without, without speculating but I mean it, it's it's really sad I know a couple of people um, and I mean in the, in the movie Suspiracy the uh, Filipino lady uh, girl I, um, I was involved in that case uh, when she was gunned down in her living room in front of her two children um, and that was shocking I mean that was just literally just brushed away and and everybody just carried on. This was a lady who was just doing her job. She was an observer and recording things as they were coming in the port. And she was very good at her job. And, um, you know, that ended her life, sadly. Yeah. Um, that, that part of the documentary was really shocking to me. And I haven't heard about it. Um, and I never even imagined that this kind of things are happening somewhere. This is just like, makes me feel this makes me feel like you can't trust anybody it's yeah well this this wasn't even slavery at sea this was actually just at home in the philippines this was a lady who going to work at the at the uh at the dock when it was coming in the eu had put a yellow notice on the philippines because of the amount of illegal fishing that was going on so because of that they put pressure on the philippines to tighten up things they had this you know these observers and she was sadly one who was very good at a job and uh, yeah, they, they sadly took care of her. Um, and she had two small boys that she left behind, so. Um, um, and that is all for questions. Thank you so much, Gary. Hey, uh, thanks for having me, Lou. <laughs>